Welcome to the alignment. Welcome to episode two of the alignment. Uh, this is the webinar which asks our speakers to align on a certain topic. Uh, I am Adam. I'm going to be your host. Um, the, the topic today is building a localization team. Things you can get right or wrong. We've got some fantastic speakers. Um, just before I go into our speakers, just a little bit about us. Uh, we are global app testing. Uh, if you want to know what we do, the clue is in the name. The, the reason that we're doing this webinar is that we have worked really closely with loads of product teams uh, to do their QA for them in a, a fast manner. We do that with our crowd testing community. So we're a community of 100,000 testers around the world in every different country, I think 190 countries and territories. Uh, and we do everything from um, basic functional QA through to user survey style stuff in all of those different countries around the world to a time frame. The reason that we're doing it is because uh, while we've done loads of amazing work with uh, product teams, we're still relatively unknown in the localization, internationalization, globalization space. And so the reason that we wanted to do this is just to kind of say that we exist because all of our most exciting work uh, with some of our biggest clients is focused on this idea of global growth uh, and starting out from that point of how do you grow in all of the different countries uh, that you're live in when you're live in a whole bunch. Um, so that's us. We obviously want to tell you a little bit about us, but we also want to hear from you. So this is trying to be a discursive webinar. We want to make it as discursive as possible. For that reason, I'm gonna encourage you as our speakers speak to use the Q and A function. Uh, apologies about the, the chat function uh, being broken, but I can see that the Q and A function is alive and well. If somebody is saying something that is interesting to you, please ask questions. Uh, I've written some questions and we've got a load of amazing questions from the entry form. So thank you for adding those. Um, but I think it's always great to add questions on the night as well. So, so please do. And we will get back to you with an answer if we can't get through. Um, our speakers today. So we've got five amazing speakers. The way that this is going to work is each of them is going to talk a little bit uh, about a, a subtopic on uh, in, in order. And then I've got a couple of questions for, for Sophia at the end. Then we're going to launch into a panel. We're going to ask all your amazing questions, and hopefully we're going to align on the subject of building a localization team between us. So first, we've got Alex. Alex is a localization project manager here at Global App Testing. He is focused on supporting some of the biggest localization businesses in the world. He's going to ask us three questions that localization teams face and maybe give us an answer. We're going to have uh, Zach second up. So Stripe obviously needs no introduction. The payments company that has increased the GDP of the internet. I think that's um, I think that's the slogan. Uh, Zach heads up localization uh, at Stripe, and he's going to be talking uh, a little bit about that function and how he's made it super efficient. Uh, Brian McConnell runs localization at Notion. He's also previously worked at Lyft and Medium. Brian's going to be talking to us a little bit about vendor management and why they've made the decision they have to bring some of their vendors in-house. Uh, and finally, Iggy, if you have been following our localization content, uh, which I'm sure everybody in the audience has, um, Iggy needs no introduction. I interviewed Iggy uh, on our blog. Uh, you should check it out. I mean, it might be posted in the chat. Uh, and uh, also we reuse some of that material in our localization playbook, which you can check out as well. Finally, uh, Sophia is the manager, uh, the CS manager over at Phrase. I've got a few questions for Sophia about what makes effective teams in the context of tooling. So I've got through that as fast as I can. I'm going to hand over now uh, to Alex, who's going to be asking us three questions uh, that localization teams face. Over to you, Alex. Thanks, Adam. Hey, everyone. I'm Alex. Uh, and as Adam mentioned, today I want to suggest three tech trends that we're observing uh, about localization teams and the way it affects localization quality. Uh, very briefly about me, I have been working at GAT for five years now. And before that, I worked in different QA roles at the gaming company. Um, I currently work as a project manager for some of the biggest teams in the world, and many of whose apps you actually use on a daily basis. Um, so today I will talk about, or I will ask three questions um, that we usually see teams face uh, and how it affects their use of uh, the global crowd. Um, so the three questions are how to incentivize and direct focus, how to think about local expertise, 
and how to deliver more, more efficiently. Jumping to the first one, uh, how to incentivize and direct focus. Now, if you attended the last webinar, um, we talked a bit about the narratives. Um, some organization teams have a series of tasks set by a, a senior team, like product or marketing, and usually they want to adapt the work they've done, which is built on a domestic theory of users. Now, this kind of team thinks about quality in a commodity sense of way, and the way they use GET reflects that. Um, usually they want to verify they've executed on the line items quickly and effectively, so they're interested in a rapid turnaround uh, that we deliver, and they're really interested in a version of QA which is about verifying the L10 and changes, and that those are accurate. Uh, their external QA is usually adversarial to their team or their, their, their LSP, sorry, um, because the system um, is designed to ensure that everybody is marking everyone else's homework. Now, the alternative is that the L10 and teams are working much more towards um, delivering a specific metric because that team is setting its own agenda. They're hung up on a question like, what's the smallest amount of work we can do for, for the biggest impact to that metric. Um, when we find something which is actionable, um, whether that's a UX issue, like an experience a local user describes, or uh, it's a compatibility issue, like a checkout is working on a certain device, we're working with the team to help identify the opportunity, as well as verifying it's subsequently being fixed. Uh, meaning that it's non-adversarial. Uh, it can be that in the first team, you have an amazing product team, which is asking these kinds of questions about international users. And because a lot of these changes can be quite specific, uh, I think a lot of the product teams have a kind of architect mentality, which involves a big roadmap. And it's the, the information often gets lost. I think it's really powerful to just keep asking what can drive growth. Uh, jumping on to the second question, how to build local expertise, um, we have seen teams handle very differently the way they build local expertise. Uh, this absolutely affects the way they do QA. Um, I read Adam's interview series. Uh, it was interesting to see that Plio, which is an expensive solution which launched across Europe last year, checked all their localized copies with their team because they felt that they couldn't trust an LSP to get the brand tone right. Now, nearly all the interviewees commented that they would have had preferred uh, local country experts in their most important markets. So somewhere like Japan, yeah, uh, for which there's more nuance to get right versus somewhere like the Nordics where everyone speaks English. Uh, the challenge is that it puts those professionals in a position of tremendous power because they become the owner of not just quality, but a uh, proxy for user sentiment. And it's very easy to lose analytic rigor and to shoot from the hip. And this person is probably not an expert in copywriting, UX and UI or local solution building, but perhaps they are an expert in every demographic and or user context. Um, are they an expert in the kinds of analytics which would enable them to perceive a serious like checkout flow, which is hidden in user data? What we need is communicable globalization data that can come in analytics to respond to different country metrics. And a lot of time we find ourselves doing these theses, uh, well, building these theses to explain the data. Uh, and perhaps the profile you need is someone who can gather that data about these different line items and share them with you or with the experts in your team. Uh, jumping on to the third question. Thank you, Adam. Um, which This one I'm going to ask uh, rather than a comment uh, because I know Zach is going to talk a little bit about this one, which is the squeeze for effectiveness. And my question is, what does effectiveness mean? Uh, because I think it actually takes us back to that primary question. Uh, what is the outcome we're going for? Is effectiveness delivering a list of actions or 
are we talking about squeezing suppliers or doing more automation or doing more with less? Uh, if effectiveness is delivering a metric, then we're talking about greater clarity on local users and their experiences and identifying how to grow where you are. Now, the way we work with the teams, the role that crowd testing plays is very different. And so are the outcomes we see. And that's where my work as a localization project manager is headed. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thanks very much, Alex. Um, I know I've been asking everybody uh, in the audience to ask questions throughout on the Q&A. Uh, I'll I'll keep pestering you to do that. But now I'm going to turn the tables on you and ask you a poll. Uh, so obviously, Alex drew a distinction there between teams which are motivated by operational metrics and incentives and teams which are motivated by commercial uh, metrics and looking after something like growth or new business. I'd love to see how it's distributed among our audience uh, and where they think they are. Uh, we're going to hold this poll open for five minutes while Zach talks, uh, and then we will close it and we'll talk about it among the other things at the end. Uh, but for now, I don't want to hog the mic anymore. I'm going to hand straight over to Zach. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Zach. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. I'm currently running localization for Stripe. Um, bring with me about a decade of experience in the industry, work both client and vendor side, um, bounce back and forth a few times. Some of the more notable companies um, I've worked for and, and try to bring some of that experience with me is uh, Uber, uh, Lionbridge, uh, and the big word. Uh, I joined Stripe in early 2022 um, as uh, the original role was to start develop the quality program or make a more formal quality program. Since then, I've taken over um, running it at a higher level, which has been um, quite quite the experience and also quite an honor. Uh, as we um, delve into today's topics, I'm probably going to approach it from a slightly different angle. That I'm going to be looking at it through the lens of building a program and discussing the the more fine points of um, tuning a team within a program to go after maximum maximum effectiveness. Um, and in my opinion, the key to building a really robust program for max effectiveness is finding the proper balance between um, kind of four things. It's kind of a, a grid of four things. It's it's internal versus external resources. And across that, it's your uh, infrastructure versus human capital. And just being able to make sure that they blend and mix in a way that's um, going off kind of Alex's last point, that works for the company's end objectives because depending on your situation and your circumstance the, the company you're working for um, the effectiveness effectiveness is going to be defined differently so i i really like the idea of building a team within this premise as opposed to just um, seeing a problem and potentially throwing a person at it and while building a team is not necessarily that uh, looking through the lens of more of a program and how to maximize overall effectiveness with all resources available, I think is going to yield a higher result. I, one last point I, I think that's kind of fun with working in the industry right now is with the advancement of technology, um, whether it's LL, um, LLM models or even just standard machine translation models, um, there's an expectation for us to become more and more efficient and more effective. That's putting a lot of pressure on people um, to scale up and meet those expectations. But what I find fascinating is we're now getting the tooling to beat those expectations. So it's no longer this like lost premise that we can do more for less. It's it's an expectation we should be hitting. So I'm excited to share my thoughts as we dive into the subject, hear um, uh, what the other panelists think and hear um, from their expertise and uh, some of your questions. So thanks so much. And I'll uh, go ahead and pass the mic back and once again, super excited to be here. Thanks very much, Zach. I'm gonna I'm gonna now close the poll. Um, so thank you for those of you that that uh, that voted in it. We'll share the results at the end and 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 discuss it a bit then. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna move straight on to Brian, head of localization at Notion. Um, Brian, uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Brian McConnell. I'm uh, head of localization at uh, Notion. And uh, prior to running a localization at Notion, I also led the localization teams at uh, Lyft, the ride sharing platform, and the blogging platform Medium, and a number of other startups. 
Um, my uh, kind of niche, I guess, is that I go into startups and growth companies when they're just really starting to build out a localization function and team and help them get systems and vendors in place and all that. Uh, most companies have almost no exposure to localization unless the founders happen to be um, um, you know, from a region where many languages are spoken, and that's often not the case, at least in the U.S., um, so what, what I'm here to talk about is the, the distribution of work between in-house resources and outside vendors. Uh, so one of the things we've been doing at Notion is really leaning into, um, you know, leveraging our own user community as part of our translation team. Um, so we're fortunate in that we have a very uh, large and active user community, and we have a lot of consultants who, you know, built businesses around helping people set up uh, Notion sites. And um, a lot of those people have background as linguists or as, as marketing copywriters. So um, we made a decision in the past few months um, to really, instead of leaning first on outside translation vendors, um, building up our own translation team and, and using vendors as kind of a backstop, you know, we, we have too much work to do. Um, and, and we've been very happy with the results because these are people who know our product better than anybody. And in many cases, they know the product better than we do. And so they really understand a lot of the terminology and you know just you know the language we use around the product, whereas an outside vendor would, is always going to struggle with that. They're never going to they'll they'll do good work, but they'll never really understand your product like you know as somebody who's virtually an employee would 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 know. Um, the one caveat I would add about that is that it works. You kind of need two things for that to work well. One is you you need an active user community who's you know, really cares about the product. Um, if it's like a business to business accounting software or something, you'll probably have a hard time finding those people. Um, and the other thing is that if the volume of work is, you know, overwhelming, it, you know, doesn't scale. Um, in our case, we have a couple hundred thousand words worth of content we need to manage in each language. And, you know, that's, that's something a small team can handle. And actually vendors in that case, in many cases, just aren't that interested because there's not that much work for them. Uh, and that's the other that was the other thing that drove us to this is that we were finding vendors are just, I mean, th there are other companies that do millions of words a month and, you know, that's, that's where they're going to, you know, focus. So um, that's my two cents and looking forward to Q and A and discussion that follows. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, just to plug the Q and A again, uh, if you do have questions, please do dive in with your concerns or questions around how to build a localization team. Obviously, we've assembled this panel. We've got loads of questions uh, have come through from the uh, from the entry form, so we've got loads to get through. But it would be great to hear yours in the audience as you're watching. Finally, I'm going to hand over to Iggy, who is here to talk about the entrepreneurial team mapping need to value. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my name is Ingvil or Iggy to most people. Um, I'm a senior localization manager at Deliveroo, which in case you're not familiar with, um, is a leading food delivery company. Um, I've been in the industry um, since about 2017, and I've been working at companies like Expedia and ClassPass um, in that time as well. I've seen some ex-colleagues from some of those companies online today, so special hello to you. Um, there's one term I've like kind of come to hate recently, but it's this like in this macroeconomic um, environment that we hear a lot. But in this economy, um, teams may not have the budget available to add additional headcount. I think that's a situation lots of us find ourselves in. Um, so that's why I would like to spend the next few minutes talking about how instead of hiring people, you can utilize the resources that you have available to move your team into the right direction. So if you're working in a business that's relatively new to localization, um, chances are that the localization team was recruited to fill a specific business need, being organizing and overlooking translation and localization, perhaps typically during um, an expansion period. Uh, this is all well and good, but I think a majority of localization professionals know that we can contribute so much more beyond just um, project management, like perhaps you'd like to move away from this expectation of localizing large volume as quickly as possible and instead focus on delivering growth um, for your company at a more strategic level. And if this sounds like you, you're probably going to want to 
redefine the localization team purpose, align it with the business needs, and start building and developing a team to deliver on that purpose. And as it sounds, it's not an easy feat by any means. Um, so it probably is something that requires you to get out of your comfort zone and harness pretty much all the skills you have in your toolkit and also be willing to learn a few new ones. And um, I think personally that this is exactly what makes it so rewarding because it's not just a chance for you and your team to grow and develop, but you're essentially rewriting your own job descriptions and you'll get so much more clarity on what additional expertise that you will need in order to get to where you want to be once hiring um, becomes more of an option. And I think the first thing you want to make sure is that you're not abandoning these tasks that your company initially kind of asked you to do. So this like more traditional project management um, just because you want to start doing something else. And one of the key reasons for that is stakeholder relationships. I'm going to say a little bit more about that as well later on, but you're going to be you're looking at making quite a big change to the perception of your team and the nature of your role. So you're going to need the buy in from the people around you um, to do that successfully. So definitely, definitely make sure that your stakeholders are happy with you along the way. Um, and this is kind of like a key thing that it's like while you're going through this transition, it's um, you're caught between doing like your old job and also hashing out your new job. And I think um, kind of to Zach's point earlier, I think a key thing to do then is um, making sure that you can make your traditional or old tasks as efficient as possible. So that could be like automation, uh, making sure you have fit for purpose project management tools, um, do pro like process improvements. Exactly what it is will depend um, a little bit on your team, but the essence there really is that you need to free up the time and the headspace to be able to focus on, on getting your team to the next level. Um, so in my case, for instance, um, this is something we're, we're constantly working on in my team and we're not by any means there yet, but I think there's a few team qualities that come really handy as we're going through this process. Um, and some of those are having mutual trust, having a democratic culture and the openness to discuss um, failure and successes as we're going through this. Um, so I think if that's, I'm, I'm conscious that not every team might have those qualities kind of, I feel very lucky that, that that's what defines my team, but um, I think there's definitely things that you can do to foster those, those qualities if you don't already have them. Um, and equally, if, if you're on a one person team, which is a position that I've found myself in in the past, it's like strange to talk about team culture, but I think if you are on your own, it's even more important to make sure that you have a support network um, around you, whether someone in the business or someone outside, um, because essentially what we're talking about is like not just building a team that works for you or building like a role that works for you, but building a whole team where you want to bring in new people and where everyone can grow and thrive. Um, so my, my last point on this before I hand it back to Adam um, is that there's like my, my philosophy here is basically that anyone's skills and interests can be an asset when you develop a team but there's one skill that's non-negotiable and that's the interpersonal one um because in order to identify the business needs um and where the localization team fits into that you do need to listen to stakeholders understand what's important to them understand what their challenges are and what, how they work um because this is a radical change and you're going to have to have those difficult conversation at some point. Um, and it's so, so, so much easier to do that if you already have a good relationship with these people. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say and looking forward to hearing your questions later on. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Iggy. That was really interesting. Um, and then finally, so we've got uh, Sophia with us. Sophia is the senior CS manager at Phrase, uh, the TMS system. Um, Sophia's not going to be speaking for us. I've got a couple of questions uh, for Sophia just before we go into the broader panel and all start piling in on the questions together. Um, Sophia, obviously, uh, T uh, um, phrase it's a TMS system and you're onboarding different customers all the time and you give clients advice as, as you onboard them I wonder if you could start by just giving us a sense of is there different advice uh, that you give to different kinds of localization teams uh, in order to promote their you know effectiveness based on their size or or some other thing that that makes a difference within localization teams that that you serve 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, just to say hi uh, to everyone, and it's a delight to be here. And, and thank you for the for the lovely introduction. Um, we don't build localization teams, obviously, as such a uh, phrase. But um, in my capacity as a customer success manager, you're absolutely right. We do um, offer our best advice, and we do look at or we come across teams, I should say, of um, yeah various uh, teams uh, structures and, and uh, things like that. So um, that's exactly where, where we would start. We would kind of have a look at what's the what's the team like? What's the size? What's the structure? What's the current uh, process that's in place? Um, where are they at? Are they only just starting out or is this a larger team um, who are looking to optimize, uh, centralize, standardize, things like that? Um, we also, it's also important to look at the available uh, resources. We, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a bit uh, croaky, um, but we look at the available resources Resources. Do you have, um, I think Brian mentioned it, like a large community that where you can pull on to, to localize? Or do you have an in-house uh, team of resources? Or are you um, pulling in uh, vendors, like language service providers, uh, things like that? So um, once we have that picture in place, uh, we also obviously need to look at um, the appropriate tooling. Uh, making sure that it's fit for purpose. What are the aims and achievements? If you have a much smaller team just starting out, they're aiming to uh, localize an app to um, enter another market or two, right? Um, that's a different scenario to having a, a much larger enterprise team where they're saying, we need to onboard different stakeholders, centralize everything and make our process as um, efficient as, as possible. So those are the kind of important considerations to bear in mind. Um, we do also have a playbook for, for localization managers. So absolutely do check that out. It's got some, um, though I, I say so myself, it's got some great advice and makes some great points in there. Um, Finally, what I would say as well, um, just to, to round off um, this question, is that you have to also be prepared to review uh, where you're at, right? To tweak the process as you go on, um, because that will set you up for success in the future. If you're, uh, you know, not afraid to take a look in the in the mirror and see, you know, where are we at and what could we improve as as the journey uh, evolves. Very good. Um, in in our in our recent report, we uh, that we're we're going to publish. So I say recent. It's actually for our forthcoming report. Um, but in our forthcoming report, we one of the things that we find is that cross functionality or working cross functionally um, across all different stakeholder groups and teams is the biggest internal pain point of the of the localization professionals in in, in this survey. I wondered, to me, that seems like something that has a solution that's, that's partly answered by tooling. Um, so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how phrase or how you think about cross-functionality in, in, in your role. Mm, absolutely. So it's it's obviously a big challenge. Like, how do you involve uh, localization in the process? At what point do you do it? I think in the past, it's it's often been the case where localization is is left uh, to the end, um, especially within software localization and, and things like that. So the the key is how do we involve uh, more teams in the process at a different stage, um, but avoiding complication. So um, I would say the answer to that is to actually enable uh, collaboration as much as possible um, and to centralize the, the translation management. And you're absolutely right where you say that's a, a, you know, a question that can be answered by tooling. Um, the way we do this at Phrase, right, to, to enable cross-team collaboration is uh, focusing on connectivity. So having uh, connectors, having plugins, having integrations to other systems that are used within um, a business, uh, be that design systems, uh, it could be code repositories, content management systems, things like that, to, to essentially make sure that each team can, can focus on what they do best, they can work in their own environments, but when it comes to localization, that um, they can connect, right? Collaborate with the localization team, um, by communicating, by connecting, and, and kind of working together in in that way, so it's it's crucial to have tooling that that allows this, um, because what you get with that is then also a, a scalable solution that can can also keep up with with growth um, and with demand. Right, we want to avoid bottlenecks as much as possible um, and set you up for for success in that way. Final question then. Um, so when people kind of start on their on their journey with you and they and they come through the door, I wonder if there's a a challenge that you see come up again and again that's the sort of the most common recurring challenge that you see among among 
different kinds of teams and 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 how you would think about that yeah we have a, a few kind of topics that that come up we've touched upon one of them um, like the lack of of cross team collaboration or the the difficulty uh, if we if we want to put it that way the difficulty in in actually getting uh, teams across the business to collaborate with each other and and handle the localization uh, in the right way at the right time um what we also see is still lots of manual work actually uh, maybe a process that isn't optimized a process that is uh, inefficient uh, bottlenecks right within the localization team where you have content coming from various other directions in the business and um, a, a team that is quite often overloaded right and and needs to have a, a more scalable solution um, to, to manage um, with automation or you know to scale up uh, their their team and and increase their output and uh, efficiency um and then another thing um i mean i'm not going to uh, rattle through like the whole list because it will sound like uh, everyone's got a long list of problems um but the final thing that i would uh, say is also um a disconnect like between the stakeholder and the localization team so this goes back to what uh, Iggy was saying about really knowing your stakeholders understanding it what is it that they need to achieve and and how can you help them uh, get there right because at the end of it ultimately it's about a collaboration right um aligning uh, to use the the phrase right the, of today uh, but aligning to to meet the company's goals um and if there's a disconnect there be that because of i don't know change management uh not implemented correctly when it comes to to tooling um then you know that can be a big blocker so yeah that's those are the things i would uh, kind of say we do see again and again amazing thank you so much uh sophia um the, sorry, I, I've got this slide I can see. This is the localization playbook that we have. So uh, if you do want to access that, we're putting it in the chat right now. Um, and it, there's, a, there's a link to ours as well. Um, right. So just before, so we've got the poll results that I can share with everybody. But just before I do that, I would love to hear a couple of other people come in on uh, some of what I talked about uh, with Sophia. Uh, Cross-team collaboration, the biggest issue, biggest challenge that we see as an internal pain point that's a, a very much a team issue. I wonder if any of our panelists had any tips for, you know, resolving challenges that, that surface around uh, internal cross-functional collaboration. Yeah, so I would say that's an issue with startups in general. Um, I mean, localization does bear the brunt of it because it's an inherently cross-functional role. And I mean, it touches every aspect of the company typically. Um, but the startups I've worked at, I mean, we're just, this is chaos for the most part. So um, if you're in a startup or growth company, it's just something you just have to learn to deal with. Uh, unfortunately, there's not really an easy fix for it, I found. So in, in your view, it wouldn't be a pain that you'd associate with larger businesses. You're, you're framing that as a, as a startup issue that is associated with the lack of processes that you get in startups. Yeah, I mean, big companies have their own set of issues, you know, you know, organizations being siloed within the company and, uh, you know, just sort of never talking to each other. Mm -hmm. But startups, even like, you know, like at Lyft, there was ample internal communication. Everybody was talking to everybody else about what they were doing. It was just that the priorities would change on a dime. And so that that, that was just, that's the thing I've noticed with startups is just the lack of top-down planning. A lot of things are happening organically and you just have to, you just have to roll with it. Fantastic. So I'll share the results now, unless anybody else wants to come in on that. I could, Zach, I can see that you're. Uh, I'll, I'll make one comment on that and just riffing on Brian's point that um, being so flat across an org, whether no matter the size of your company, you're, you're going and asking people for their time. Um, it's, we want to be as close to the, initial production as possible and that's usually when people are the busiest and they really don't want as much influence or they might not want to hear it but what's cool is because we are flat we can also bring things to the table that might be valuable to them to whether it's um, information about what another organization is doing that they could leverage or just something along those lines so I think looking at through the lens that it's also presents opportunities not just to solve our problems but to solve that other team's problems tends to move the needle um, that, that was that was my one thought on uh, on the subject. Fantastic. Okay, cool. So the the results. So 
I wonder whether um, any of you guys have any comments on the results. The uh, what we can basically see is that the the most important incentives are commercial for more businesses than they are operational. So that implies to me that uh, the localization teams are really explicitly being targeted on things like MPS, new business growth. That, that's, is that sort of in line with, Alex, you kind of differentiated the, between those two different kinds of teams. Is, is that in line with what you expected? Any of the other panelists, is it in line with what you would expect for this kind of thing? Um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so it, it makes sense. I mean, the one thing I would um, emphasize, and particularly for anybody that's in a localization role, um, it's often unfair to be graded on, on you know, economic metrics because localization is just one factor in your success in a market. Like I would, I would highlight Japan as an example. So we have, we've been doing very well in Japan in particular, um, but we have a full, you know, we have an in-country sales team and marketing team that are really driving that growth. Um, so the localization in Japanese is, I mean, it's a, a prerequisite for us getting business in that market because uh, very few people speak English in Japan. But even if we had done perfect localization, but we had done no marketing work, um, you know, it wouldn't have delivered much in terms of results. So I, I, I generally prefer to be graded on operational metrics. And then, you know, the marketing team, that's the team that gets graded on, on revenue metrics. That's just my you know, my two cents. Yeah, and I actually agree with Brian. Uh, I would put like commercial metrics uh, third on my list. Um, so the first would be like the linguistic quality um, metrics. Uh, so the terminology, the mistranslations, omissions, additions, whatever they may be. Um, and then maybe user experience, uh, which might differ. Uh, depending on you know, the markets. Uh, we have seen that in quite a few cases for our customers. And then lastly, on the third place for me, I would say it would be the business metrics, yeah. Very good. Um, cool. Well, unless anybody else wants to come in on, on that one, um, one one thing I'd like to do just to sort of kick off the, the conversation in earnest. So obviously the title of this webinar is building a localization team things you can get right and wrong um and so i wonder whether each of our panelists could come in with something that they think is particularly important to get right um or that can cause you particular issues when you get it wrong and and maybe a little bit of advice on on how to uh, how to get it right Would, it, can, do, would anybody like to go first? Can I? I yeah, I can. Alex? Um, I would say, uh, I think Iggy mentioned this uh, as well, like team culture and effective communication within the team. And uh, not just within the team, but with other stakeholders as well. Um, but I do believe this having a, a, an appropriate mindset and culture like would enable everyone in the team to align to the same goals. And objectives, uh, and that would really drive the needle uh, in the end. Um, and plus, it's always a nice bonus to work in a fun environment with sociable people. So, fantastic. Anybody? Anybody else? Yeah, I would say one of the most important questions to resolve is where the localization team is going to live within the company. Um, because it's really kind of an oddball uh, function and it could end up in product, it could end up in engineering, it could end up, end up in marketing. Um, and my experience has been, you know, it's really important to be in a part of the company that's focused on growth. Uh, so like at Notion, we, you know, we're part of the marketing team, even though, you know, we're fairly technical and we work closely with engineering, uh, we ultimately roll up to marketing and they, they look at the spend on localization as, as you know, the same as like running billboard advertising and things like that. It's, it's a, you know, it's a growth lever. Um, and because of that, it's adequately resourced and people aren't constantly asking us questions about, hey, you know, can we reduce the per word prices here and there? And, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, they're, they're much more interested of like, okay, if we spend a million dollars on, on localization, how much money are we going to get back? And the answer is several times as much as you spend. Um, 
that's where you want to be. Where you don't want to be is in an organization that's going to view localization as a cost center, because um, then you're just going to constantly be struggling to get resources. And if you are in a localization uh, business that that looks at as localization as a cost center, is is there, is there advice that you would give? Is it just you should just leave? Is that is that the answer, or is it that you is there a way that you can kind of navigate to uh, a business structure that really values what you do? Do you think? Well, I, I would say you you want to push to be you know reorg you know to have a reorg so you're you know in the right place in the company. So, for example, you don't generally want to report to engineering, although you do need engineering support. You know, I mean, there's a lot of technical work that needs to be done. But if you live in engineering, um, you're going to run into a bunch of issues like with it being viewed as a cost center. The other thing you'll run into is people saying, hey, can't you just machine translate everything? AI is great. It's awesome. And you constantly have to push back on that kind of thing. Um, so no, I don't think you just pack up and leave, but you, you definitely want to try to get moved to a different part of the organization uh, before, you know, before you get to that point. Very good. So uh, obviously we're going through the most important thing to get uh, right and not to get wrong in, in localization. Um, so I don't think we've had Zach or Iggy yet. Do either of you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I think mine's kind of similar to Brian's um, in that there's there's a tendency to look at localization as just a service as in we need X, you deliver X. Um, and moving away from that it requires telling a story, at least in my experience. It's And it goes back to, okay, by delivering X, what's, what's it actually doing for the company? And being able to tell that story, um, whether it's not, it's always, may, maybe some of you could relate, it's always hard to draw a strict line to ROI within localization and not potentially be stepping on other toes, but it doesn't mean you can't tell a story of, the overall value add. And I think that's that's the main thing is it's not not um, cornering yourself as a service, but more of a value add for the company itself. That is a super interesting one. And we've actually got, I will get to you, uh, Iggy and Sophia, but we do actually have a follow-up question that kind of relates to that, which is uh, one of the entry form questions. How do you get common consensus on what you should be doing as a localization team when there are people disagreeing and what metrics do you use? This is the one that I think relates to it to convince stakeholders of the value of localization. So Zach, when you were talking about a, um, a clear localization story there, is that is that about metrics? Is that about, you know, uh, Brian talked about, you know, being in a, a growth part of the business. How How do you actually walk up to your manager and say, here are the metrics and and, and the, the way that we're really delivering value? 100%. Um, it depends what company you're working for. Um, I, I work for a fintech company, not going details, but the the value add might be starkly different than, you know, the value add of what uh, Lyft or like an Uber or a Google is, is looking for. So it's it's about aligning your story with what the company is looking for, whether it's growth, whether or it's quality. Um, you need to see what stage of the stage your uh, company is in, know the target audience, and then align your story to that. Um, if you're in a growth stage and they're just wanting to expand country after country, well, show show how localization can you know be the lever that makes that happen quicker. If they're looking for more ROI next year with with less money, um, start talking about machine translation and start talking about the different levers that we have that that can um, not just impact you know just our our one division, but the the company as a whole. And I think that's the the best angle to take is just. Look at your own situation um, and measure it from there. So most important thing you can get right or wrong. I think we're, we've we still got answers to come from uh, Iggy and Sophia. Do either of you want to jump in on that one next? I, I can jump in on that one. Um, I dare say also you're not going to be surprised by what I think uh, is important to get right. Uh, it's about having um, a right tool in place, having a good TMS um, in place. It will enable you to, to work efficiently. It will enable you to actually going back to, to what Zach said, um, show also return on, on investment, right? So investing in a TMS, it does make sense uh, in the long run because with that you have also translation memories, right? You have term bases for a terminology which will enable you to leverage content again and again, right? So the kind of spend reduces that you have or the outlay um, because you can leverage content that you have already localized in the past. Fair enough, you, you might still tweak it, but you you build 
right? Those memories of, of content that you can can use again and again, right? Um, specific to your business, to your company. Um, and a second point on that is that search the TMS, right? Um, others are available. Um, search TMS, they will also deliver data, right? Have that metric in place, be that throughput, right? To, to highlight, you know, within the business, what are you actually uh, processing? What are you delivering on? It could be other metrics like um, the time spent, right? The turnaround times, things like that. Um, so having a right, the right tool in place will, will enable you to deliver on, on all of those things. And finally, over to Iggy, the final person to, to answer um, most important thing to get right in a localization team. Uh, do, you, do you have an answer for us? Yeah, sorry, I was frantically typing notes. Trying to, <laughs> not, to not say the same thing as has already been said, but I, I will play a little bit on it because I think it's very interesting. Um, particularly this um, topic of like, where is the localization team placed within the company? I don't think I've ever seen kind of like a similar, in any of the companies I've worked in, it's never been a similar setup. There's always been um, different placements and that has loads of different implications as well. Um, but it's one of those annoying things where actually as a localization professional, you're very likely not going to have the chance to influence that decision, right? Because if someone decides that we need to set up a localization team from the get-go, um, that decision is ultimately made by someone else. So even if you are the first hire, you can definitely challenge it. But once that team has been set up, it's so difficult to um, to change it in my, in, in my experience. Um, so if then, like, instead of focusing on what you can impact, I think it's important to, obviously from the placement, you can draw a few assumptions about what the company is expecting from you and expecting you to deliver, whether or not that aligns with your values, you kind of relate to what I talked about earlier, that depends. Um, but I would use that as kind of like the, the basis for understanding what is expected of the team. Um, and then make sure that you get the, um, the um the team members that can deliver on that um on that promise or on that the requirement rather um and i i, I fully support what, what sophia was saying as well about having the tooling um to also match with whatever your your company's goals are because there are so many tools out there these days and um while there are loads of similarities there are also quite a few differences and you know, different tools specialize in different things. And I think um, it's important to be conscious about making those decisions. And it's maybe somewhere where a localization professional would be asked for their opinion rather than it being from someone higher up um, making that decision. So I think that's a very key point where you can actually influence the decisions. Thanks very much, uh, Iggy. So it's we've got 10 minutes to go. I've just got to quickly go through some housekeeping notes. The first note to say is that there is another episode of the alignment hot on the heels of this one it is in two weeks time uh it is on the july 26th that is wednesday same time as this uh in two weeks if you're enjoying this one it would be great to see you there we have got speakers from hubspot rs xtn and we've also got another speaker um the reason that it is held up is it is with their pr team awaiting approval as we speak obviously you can infer it is a slightly bigger business so we're really excited about them and that is going to be about speed and scale without compromising quality so really excited about that you can uh there's a, a link being posted in the chat right now and you can you can scan this link if you would like to join us uh, in addition to that, if you'd like to learn more about phrase, uh, please do scan this uh, QR code. Uh, I'm, I'm personally, I'm not very good at QR codes. I get the phone out and, and, and fumble. So I think the link is being posted in the chat as well. Uh, they've got all kinds of exciting offers and deals. And I think you've had a chance to hear a little bit more about phrase. Um, and then the final plug before we return to the, the questions um, is that we are offering a free test. So Obviously, global app testing allows you to send your, your product around the world to understand different user experiences. If you would like to take advantage of that service, you can sign up right here, right now, and then we will give you a free test if you qualify. So we'll contact you within 24 hours and get you started so you can understand a little bit about what that means. 
uh, and how we can help you understand the different experiences that your users are having around the world. Um, so do take advantage of that. It is not something that we uh, are able to offer every time. Um, yeah, hop, hop, hop right on and, and, and have a go. So I will now uh, return to the questions. Um, so we talked a little bit about in-house versus uh, external localization resource. I, I wonder if our panelists have uh, an idea of something that they would they would always outsource or something that they would always keep in-house no matter what uh, within the localization function. If there's, if there's any strong opinions you guys have about this should be in-house uh, or, or, or vice versa. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's anybody who wants to, to jump in on that. First of all, Brian's put up his hand. Yeah, um, so a, a good example for us would be help center content versus marketing copy. Marketing copy, I think we're always going to want to have our hands on that just because, you know, our, our people understand the product uh, really well. Help center content, that's the kind of thing we're pretty comfortable sending to an agency or if it's a second tier language, you know, even machine translating it because honestly, who reads the manual? Um, but um, definitely, you know, the, the high visibility content, whether it's marketing copy or, you know, high level, high visibility content within our apps, uh, that's that's generally the kind of stuff we want to handle in house as much as possible. Fantastic. I'm just aware we're slowly running down on time, so I do want to get to some of the questions in the chat. Um, so we've got a question from Jenna here. Jenna says she, uh, she is a localization project manager who manages some projects of large scale in more than 45 languages and 80 locales. They rely on uh, more than 80 percent on vendors for their workload. Question to the panel. When you manage a project of many languages and locale, what is your main management style? Are you in waterfoil, agile, uh, lean six sigma? I'm actually not familiar with that one or or some something else. So, uh, yeah, I don't know whether you guys will go in for formal management styles. Zach's put up his hand. Yep, I, I think this one, it's this is a this is an old one. It's a fun one. Um, it really depends on your situation and the, the content you're working on. I, I feel like I'm saying that a lot. But that being said, it's always looking through that like lean six lens, at least from the companies I work for. Even if your your number one goal is just high quality, um, you still need to do it in an efficient and effective manner. So whether you're you have like the timing to actually plan something out in more of a waterfall fashion, you're still gonna want to look to that lens of maximum efficiency, which I know that's not like sticking truly to the the lean six um way, but that's the way I kind of look at it, that there's like one perfect answer for it but as long as you kind of look through that lens you're probably on the right track very good does anybody want to else want to come in on that one before i move to the next question anyone have a a preferred management style for for managing lots of different external vendors very good okay um so uh, an anonymous attendee has asked on brian's example in japan uh, so maybe one for you brian how do you separate out the other factors that contribute to growth from the impact of localization? So obviously earlier we were saying that it is unfair to measure localization's effectiveness just in terms of growth because there's so many other things that come into it. Is there a way that you can separate that out and make more intelligent decisions? Um, over to you, Brian. Yeah, I'd say it's actually, I mean, it, it's a real challenge. Um, I think you know in markets like Japan, it's it's pretty easy to see. It's easier to see, um, but in a lot of markets like in Europe, where you know the rate of English proficiency is quite high and multilingualism in general is quite high, um, it, it's a lot harder to tease that signal out compared to everything else because you typically have confounding factors like you know there's a big marketing push along with the localization. So is it being driven by the marketing push or is it being driven by localization or is it a combination of the two? Um, so one of, one of the things I, I like to do when I'm making the case for resourcing is uh, to, you know, to look at what other peer companies have done or are doing um, and point out that it's like, well, there's a reason why our competitors are in 15 languages and you know, we shouldn't assume they just did that on a whim. Um, and, you know, you can also look at the growth story of, you know, of older companies that went from being in one language to being in multiple languages, like Facebook is kind of a classic example of that. Um, you know, and there's a degree of common sense to it. Um, you know, if you, if you want to be successful in certain markets in particular, I mean, 
being in those languages that are relevant is is it's a prerequisite to doing anything else. You know, if you, there's no point in hiring salespeople in Japan if, if your product isn't in Japanese. But actually, you know, putting together a dashboard that shows that we're getting X dollars back from our spend on localization is, is really very difficult. Very good. Um, the next question in the Q&A uh, is, so it's, I think um, Brian's marked that, but also for Sophia, in built, building an internal TMS system uh, rather than buying something off the shelf. So I would imagine that is from somebody from a, a larger organization if they're going to start building internal tools. Is that something that you see um, at Phrase? Is it, you know maybe working with people on bespoke modules? What what do you what do you think of that? We do see it absolutely. I mean, we also see the case where clients have had an in-house um, translation management system in the past, um, but then come to us because they say, we don't have the resources to maintain it anymore, right? Um, for for whatever reason that may be, right? Uh, be it manpower, people power, be it uh, the spend, be it the effort of actually um, keeping it at a level where other, you know, TMSs, that exist on the market are already one step ahead. So um, I think um, ha having or purchasing a TMS, investing in a TMS would be, I mean, I, I say it <laughs> um, because of obviously working where I work, but um, it, you're always gonna have an advantage that way, right? You don't need to take care of that development yourself um, and you will have also compatibility, um, right? Vendors, vendor agnostic systems uh, where you can, when you need to scale, um, bring in other vendors on, on that platform uh, much more easily, I would say. So yes, absolutely, we do see it, um, but I would um, probably err towards saying actually that a more scalable solution in the long run would be to invest in a TMS. Fantastic, thank you, Sophia. Just, just before I move on, I'm conscious that we only have a couple of minutes left. Does anybody else in the panel have any experience that would relate to that? Because I know that that's a quite a niche thing um, that not anybody could jump in on. Okay. Uh, I'll just say, don't oh, do that. On. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, engineering time is very scarce and their time is better spent. Like if there's something the TMS doesn't do, then you build tooling around the TMS. That's usually pretty straightforward, but don't try to build a TMS. <laughs> That's, I, I, I like that. That's a, uh, a straight question with a straight answer. Too, too many people uh, talk, talk around the subject. Um, okay, so, so final question for the Q&A. Um, so if you do have to drop off, I'm aware it's uh, six o'clock. Uh, by all means, leave us. It was great to have everybody here. Um, I'm going to stay on for just a few more minutes, maybe three more minutes, just to get through the final couple of questions. And then we will uh, say goodbye formally. But um, if you are, if you do have to leave us, thanks so much for joining. Uh, it was great to see you. And again, we hope to see you on the next uh, webinar, uh, which I can click through to the slide for. So yes, uh, do sign up uh, and, and make sure you come to the next one. So final questions. Uh, thank you, everybody, for just staying on one more minute. Um, Constantin asks, do you see localization teams expanding their area of responsibility and taking custody over large language models in the organization it took us the whole webinar but we got to the ai question in the end uh it, it's an inevitability of these things zach um i think you've marked that as something you want to answer shall i pass over to you sure that's, that's, that's a fun one um so i i view my roles shifted a little bit and i see this in other organizations to where you're just not the person that's producing but you're also stepping into more of a consulting role especially with larger, larger organizations that are spinning up resources dedicated to this work, not just in the localization space. So it needs going back to that Lean Six uh, statement, looking through the lens of just being efficient. Right now, it makes sense to stay educated and step into a consulting role. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief for time. Fantastic. Thank you, then. I think that was our final question. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Don't forget to attend the next one, uh, which is happening this time on uh, the 26th of July in two weeks' time. Uh, it was great to have you. And if you would like to take advantage of that free test, then do just click the link. We'll send you uh, a follow-up email after so you can check your inboxes as well. And I will bid everybody uh, adieu. It's uh, 6 o'clock here in the UK, so we're off home. Um, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see you in two weeks. We hope. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye, everyone. Uh, I've actually got to click end now. Bye, guys. <laughs>